Hi, I'm Craig Smith, a former New York Times correspondent and host of the podcast Eye on AI. I'm also a special government employee at the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. And in this role, I'm serving as the host for NSCAI's podcast series on the Commission's work. At the beginning of March this year, the Commission issued its final report to the President and Congress outlining its recommended strategy for winning in the artificial intelligence era. This week, I spoke to NSCAI staff Kevin McGinnis and Raina Davis about the Commission's recommendations for increasing public visibility about the government's AI needs and lowering the barrier of entry for companies that want to help meet those needs. I hope you find the conversation as useful as I did. We're going to talk about public-private partnerships and making the government a better customer, something I'm interested in because I talk to a lot of startups and I generally hear that they shy away from working with the government because it's such a complicated endeavor and takes so much time. Why don't we start by having you each introduce yourselves and then I'll get to some of the questions. My name is Kevin McGinnis, and I'm one of the directors for research and analysis on the commission. And I cover a range of topics, but public-private partnerships is one of them. I also focused on promoting and protecting technology advantages in areas like hardware. And I came to the commission from the Office of Management and Budget, where I focused on defense investment and other topics. Over to Raina. My name is Raina Davis, also a director of research analysis at the commission. I joined the commission last May and joined a line of effort focusing on investing in AI R&D. A lot of my work has focused with Kevin on the public-private partnerships and where we can be a better partner and customer for companies, specifically national security. Thanks to you both. The DOD has made a big push to re-engage with Silicon Valley over the last several years. How do your recommendations fit into what the DOD is already doing through the Defense Innovation Unit and other digital initiatives? And what's next for DOD in Silicon Valley? The good news is that the Department of Defense has spent a lot of emphasis and focus over the last several years re-engaging with Silicon Valley. I give it as re-engaging because the history of Silicon Valley is so closely tied with the Department of Defense going all the way back to the post-war era, from the invention of the microchip, radar, electronic warfare. You know, these are all things that come from Silicon Valley. But there was a recognition under the previous administration, under Secretary of Defense Ash Carter, that we needed to spend more time engaging with Silicon Valley. We need to do a better job of bringing some of those technologies into the Department of Defense. And so that was the start of what became Now the Defense Innovation Unit used to be the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental. One of the interesting points, though, is that one of the first questions we had to ask ourselves is, how is the relationship between DoD and Silicon Valley going? Is it it going well? There's been a lot of articles in the press, especially after things like the decision by Google to leave Project Maven, and a lot of concern about whether or not the relationship between DoD and Silicon Valley is healthy. The assessment that we reached as a result of our commission is that actually the relationship is quite strong. And if you look at some of the data points, for example, Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology, they actually surveyed AI researchers. And they found that most researchers and industry professionals want to work with the Department of Defense. They're positive about working with DoD on AI-funded projects. So sometimes you see in the press a discussion of a cultural rift or gap between Silicon Valley and D.C., I don't think that's true. I think what is the case is that a lot of companies are shy about working with the department because it's difficult, because it's complex, because it's bureaucratic. And so a lot of our recommendations took to improve on what groups like the Defense Innovation Unit are already doing and make them at a bigger scale. How can we expand what's already happening, but do it in a bigger way? So a lot of those things that you'll find in the report are focused on getting to the next phase of the relationship between DOD and Silicon Valley. In fact, as a result of the commission, we actually had 
Dr. Schmidt hosts a roundtable discussion or fireside chat between the vice president of Google for Global Affairs, Kent Walker, and then director of the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, General Shanahan. And that was a point when Google recommitted to working with DoD. Google said, we're open for business to work with the Department of Defense. I think it's time to close the chapter on some of these concerns around a cultural rift and really focus on how do we make the Department of Defense a better customer for these companies and make it a better place where small, innovative companies of all sizes want to do business. For listeners that aren't familiar with DIU, the Defense Innovation Unit, how do they work currently? The Defense Innovation Unit is a small outpost that is in Silicon Valley. It's actually located near NASA Ames Research Facility, one of the storied research facilities in the area and shows, again, the track record of government involvement in Silicon Valley. But the the way that DIU works, and I say this full disclosure as a former employee, I used to work at the Defense Innovation Unit. The way it works is it's really focused on solving priority problems of the Department of Defense quickly and working with startups quickly. So how can we get funding on contract to a company fast and then do a a pilot program and see if it works and then scale it? But it's really about speed. So how can we bring funding to solve some of these problems that the Department of Defense faces, but then also work at the speed of business so that companies are actually getting a fast yes or a fast no, if that's the case. And experience what they would typically experience with a sales cycle, maybe on the enterprise side or with another business. That's the goal. And so does DIU get queries from different agencies that say they're looking for a particular computer vision application, and then DIU, because of its relationship in the Valley, introduces somebody and then helps manage the relationship to make sure that it doesn't get held up in purchasing authorities or acquisition authorities or things like that? Or is it the other way around? Do companies that want to work with the Defense Department approach DIU and pitch them on solutions and hopefully get introduced to an agency? So it's a little bit of both. I think the way to think about it, if you're a company, let's imagine you're a company and you want to work with Defense Innovation Unit. Go on their website. Uh, They put out solicitations. They're called commercial solution openings. And it essentially details what the Department of Defense is looking for in a specific area. A recent one was on 5G, but they put out clear, easy to understand, non-DOD technical jargon explanations of what the department's looking for. And then the expectation is that a company puts in a solution or a white paper, a set of slides, something very simple, basically akin to a pitch deck. And you get that in within two weeks or so, and then there's a follow-up or a meeting. So that's what you experience more or less on the company side. Although companies meet with DIU all the time and also bring technology scouting element to it, showing what's possible, what are the latest computer vision algorithms, maybe things that the Department of Defense has never even heard of. And so there's that element too. But on the Defense Department side, other parts of the Defense Department and even other agencies as well, they bring what are called priority problems. So things they're trying to solve, things that they need commercial industry to help them with. And then the Defense Innovation Unit finds the companies, find the potential organizations that might be able to solve the problem, and then make sure that once they're on contract, they're meeting their milestones. The other thing is that the Defense Innovation Unit expects that other organizations will bring some money to solve the problem too. So let's pretend something related to the Air Force. The Air Force would then need to bring some funding to help pay for the, the work with the contractor or with the small company. But the focus is really on speed and on getting money on contract to a company within 90 days of first contact. And how do the recommendations expand that? And then how do the recommendations expand the defense industrial base generally? And is this about startups or is there a role for defense primes? And are there startups that are becoming new defense primes? So DIU is under the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, and r e is the CTO for the department. So as the Chief Technology Officer, it really has the strategic and policy role to advise the department on where it should be making these investments in terms of new capabilities, where it needs to be prioritizing, and how it should be funneling 
these initial investments. DIU is just one of the number of innovation initiatives across the department. There's a number in the services such as AppWork. One of our big recommendations was to network these digital innovation initiatives under r as an executive agent. The idea would be to really bring top-down leadership and top-down focus on these efforts in a way that doesn't impact their autonomy or their bottom-up development, which is really a key to what brings innovation into the department. So what our recommendation calls for, essentially, is to coordinate activities across these different defense innovation initiatives and network them under r and and also have them publish an annual go-to-market strategy that would be coordinated closely with the USD ANS and r to really make sure that all of the initiatives are moving towards common objectives to scale their impact. If they all go to market with the same goals, they will signal more effectively to private companies where to invest in R&D and also signal to private investors. We also think that if there is go-to-market strategy supported at the level of an r and this would improve the likelihood that these commercial technologies will actually transition into sustainable programs. So that's one of our big recommendations in terms of expanding the defense industrial base. But there's also a number of recommendations that we have that focus more on just democratizing access to resources and scaling and focusing federal AI R&D funding. We've called for the government to go beyond just basic research funding because a lot of the value of AI is in its application. And so a number of our recommendations focus on how do you target federal investments into later stage technologies, which are necessary to support the breakthroughs, especially for military technologies. We've called for the establishment of a national AI research infrastructure to democratize access to critical resources like cloud computing, data, and also test bed facilities. And then finally, we've called for funding for networks of U.S. regional innovation clusters in areas of untapped innovation potential. And these would really promote the interaction between both government, academia, and the private sector, and also foster the growth for small businesses and strategic sectors, including national security, where there might not necessarily be private investment right now, but with the right commercial incentives in terms of target investment, there would be interest and activity from the private sector. And is the idea to put an umbrella over them so that people or companies don't have to figure out which to go to, or if they know about two and don't know about the other ones, that there's some cross-sharing of information. The idea is to unify that in some way so that from the company side, they would have only one point of contact to reach all of those. Is that right? The idea would be for companies that are not familiar with working with the DoD and have a starting point There's been a lot of effort by various entities, including DIU, to have more user-friendly interfaces for companies entering the DoD procurement space. What contract field calls are available to them, what funding looks like, where they should be targeting. So one of the ideas was just to have a little bit more coordination on the DoD side so that the communication that was going out to the private sector was both clearer um, and easier to find. It's hard for a company to figure out right now what door to enter to access the department. The Defense Innovation Unit is one door, but really there have been many. Almost every part of the department has opened an innovation organization of some kind in the last couple of years. And so our vision here is how do we bring them all together and make sure that it's easier to understand for a small company, who do I talk to? What are their focus areas? What are their priority areas? What funding might be available? And that helps to, one, explain to companies where the department's priorities are. And two, also helps the government itself get its house in order to understand what its own priorities are. So it's very similar to what you said, Craig. It's a vision of having these groups just work a little bit more closely together. They're all doing great things independently. But like you said, it's a bit confusing if you're a company to know where to go at this point. And where would that initial point of contact reside? In one of these units? Or would it be an office that coordinates approaches from the private sector and directs them to one of these entities? So we wanted to maintain as much autonomy and not really impede on what these organizations are already doing. So they already have their own websites and points of contact. So we wouldn't necessarily change that. Rather, it would be having R&E be there in a supporting structure to both support in the back end, provide a, a digital platform for them to share best practices, to communicate directly to each other and also 
help track programs and target investments, and then also to be a way for programs that are ongoing, but maybe there isn't the appetite or the funding vehicle available to make sure that these companies aren't just left and don't fall into the valley of death. Is this all about startups or is there a role for defense primes? And do you expect that a new breed of defense primes would rise out of this shift to software from hardware? The exciting thing is that there are a lot of companies looking at entering this space that are software first. They're coming at this from a new angle. But it's going to take companies of all sizes and backgrounds to achieve artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies at the scale that we need. The defense primes can't do it alone. They need the help of Silicon Valley innovative software-based technology companies to bring in that innovation. But in many cases, a small startup might not have the ability to scale to the level of the Department of Defense. And that's where a defense prime that has experience working at the gigantic scale of the Department of Defense can help bring some of those more innovative solutions and then move them across the various platforms that the, the Department of Defense either already has or, or plans to develop. So our vision is really a collaborative one, and it would be a mistake to think that Silicon Valley will replace all the defense brands. There's always going to be a role for the different parts and how they work together and how they engage with each other. I think that's where a lot of our recommendations look to make improvements. How do we bring these different types of companies together for the good of the department and the good of the nation? Given that AI is the ultimate dual-use technology, how can the government better leverage or steer private investment toward national security applications? One thing we realized is that a lot of it has to do with identifying priorities internally and then externally communicating them to industry. They've made a lot of strides in the last few years in terms of putting out a number of modernization priorities, but these tend to be quite broad. So AI is one of them, microelectronics, a number of different areas. But the problem is that the way that these are communicated is incredibly broad that it can't really translate into a research and development plan for a company, a clear signal to prior investors, and it's worth making that initial investment in a company now. So we've called for the DoD to produce a technology annex to national defense strategy that would link the DoD's technology investment strategy to future operational needs. And this annex would include roadmap for designing, developing, fielding, and sustaining critical technologies that are needed to address the operational challenges which are identified in the NDS. This technology annex would then be supported by an integrated technical intelligence program from across the community that currently does different forms of tech scouting for their own internal purposes. So USD R&E already has a component called strategic intelligence analysis that helps drive technical intelligence. And this would help them map out the emerging technologies that are being used or developed by both our competitors and where our allies are investing, and then also what capabilities there are in the private sector that might be beneficial if applied to the national security space. We call for this technology annex to be accompanied with an unclassified version for the private sector to fill. When we talk about making recommendations related to public-private partnerships, often the focus is on the government and what it can do better. But you know, there's a role for industry, too. And the focus here on these recommendations was how can industry be more effective or more able to scale some of the things that they're already doing? How could it be scaled to a larger level, have a bigger impact across the United States? Well, give me an example of what that means. I take, for example, a large company, I think Microsoft or Amazon or any of the largest Google, any of these companies, they do a lot of work related to corporate social responsibility and training people across the country using charitable giving to help reskill workers, give them digital skills, technical skills, those sorts of things. But if we want to do that at the scale that's necessary to make sure that every American has access to the digital skills they need to succeed in an era where AI defines everything we do, you know, individual companies on their own isn't going to be enough. So these companies are going to have to work together. And right now, there's no structure for them to do that. And so what we've called for is some coordination among industry to take what they're already doing, but then work together, coordinate their, their you know, processes, make their charitable giving more impactful. And specifically, we say a target of about a billion dollars over five years for these activities, again, to make sure that every American has the skills that they need 
to use AI. So the specific goal would be more funding from more companies in a more coordinated way across the United States. Coordinated by some industrial body? Or the commissioners are mostly out of industry. Is, is there talk about how they would do this coordination? The idea that we put forward in the report would be a, a nonprofit of some kind. It could be an existing nonprofit, could be a new nonprofit. An example, one that we think does a really great job is Partnership on AI. They're focused mostly on standards, though. And so this would be more on bringing some of the capabilities of reskilling and upskilling to folks across the United States. So it's a slightly different mission, and we think it would best coordinated by a nonprofit rather than the federal government itself. And so they would coordinate the fundraising, and then that money would go toward educational institutions or government programs. How do you envision that playing out? The funding would flow to a couple different areas, probably not back to the government, but most likely to academic research organizations. Many of these companies already have programs where they use the technology they've developed in-house to help train people. So you could scale that digitally. But the focus is definitely more on industry and academia. And then they would use that funding to develop educational programs or scale the educational programs that they're already doing to make sure that they can reach a much broader scope of the United States. And the goal, again, being every person that wants to have access to this type of training or reskilling would be able to have access to it for free. There is a private education industry that's been around for a little while, the boot camps, but it's coalescing into more focused and better recognized certificate programs. Would any of the money go to that? A lot of those are very effective, but they're also very expensive. Those programs are great and they've definitely improved. They're often training people to be a high-end software engineer or to get a software development role at one of these larger companies or a small company too. Not everyone's going to be a software developer. But everyone is going to have to have digital skills to be able to interact in whatever business or professional role they may have over the course of their career. So it's definitely a broader focus. And it could be potentially expanding some of the programming that already exists, taking that and making it more accessible to more people. But I do think it's a slightly broader reach than what the current programs have in mind. And would any of that reach into the public education system? I saw a statistic recently that was really disturbing that some huge percentage of American high schools do not offer any computer science courses. One of the big elements of our report is talent and education and specifically STEM education. And so we have a a number of recommendations around STEM education. I think those are a bit distinct from this. I think the focus of this public-private partnership and this funding for things related to corporate social responsibility is more focused on adults and folks beyond the educational system, although it could be really anyone, whereas we do have a whole suite of recommendations that are targeted directly at the educational system at all levels, from pre-K all the way through university and graduate training, too. We tried to cover the waterfront, and maybe the way to think about this is it's more for folks that have already finished their formal education, and they're looking for other ways to upskill, reskill, and prepare themselves for future technological change. How can the government become a better customer for AI companies? You've outlined some of the recommendations, but is there a general view that's come out of the commission? It starts with communicating technology priorities before you're a customer, when you're onboarding as a customer, and then when you're actually working on a project. So on the first stage, when you're a prospective company that's just connecting with the DoD, we have a number of recommendations that lower the barrier to entry, especially for small companies and those that have never worked in the defense space. And these include things like connecting companies to DoD customers earlier in the process, publishing a playbook for small businesses, a lot of the things that happen already at the Small Business Administration. And then once you are actually have that contract, we've looked at a number of ways where the government can provide more reliable and sustainable funding. But a problem is that a lot of these early contracts are small in size, and they get through their first and second phases. But then the third phase, there is a dedicated funding pool And so a number of these just 
die off. So how do we actually provide more sustainable funding and allow startups and small businesses to have the time and space to grow their business as they're working on a technology itself? A lot of these prototyping contracts are too focused on just the technology funding, and there's no kind of support or ways for small companies to work in their own operations. And then the government on its side is not really vetting these companies that it's doing business with for their viability and their commercialization potential. I think it's interesting how we approach this problem. We said, why don't we ask companies who actually want to work with the Department of Defense and the US government what they think? So we put out a request uh, for information. And we were really lucky that a number of companies submitted actually 80 written pages of recommendations for us. And they said, here are the things we think the government needs to fix so that it can be a better customer for us. And then we use that to inform our recommendations. And, and a lot of those recommendations made it directly into the report. And as Raina said, the focus is one on communicating the priority problems more clearly. So what does the Department of Defense or other parts of the US government really need from the commercial sector? And then two, the funding. How do we bring consistent, stable funding at a, a larger scale to industry so that they can take these successful pilot programs once we've vetted them? and then make them available broadly, whether it's across the Department of Defense or it's across you know, any part of the U.S. government. The final part I would add is once they are working on a contract per se, do they have the tools, institutional support, and customers or access to end users and customers to actually develop a technology that they are contracted to do? A number of these recommendations that actually just work on the DOD getting its own shop in order, building up its basic digital plumbing, and tools would be very beneficial to companies that are trying to work in the space. We started out talking about the rapprochement between Silicon Valley and the defense establishment. Is the ambition from all of these recommendations that in five or 10 years, there will be a much closer cooperation between the two, the private and public sides? One of the great things about innovation in the United States is that it's, it's bottom up. And that distinguishes us from places like China and their policy of military-civil fusion. So the goal here is to have enough collaboration while still maintaining all of the important elements of innovation in the United States, which are really ground-level driven. And so what we recommend looking forward, we started with AI, but we looked at other technologies too. And we said, one, we need a national technology strategy that kind of explains not just to the government, but also to industry, what are the priorities on behalf of the United States government that industry should seek to invest in, use their internal research and development money to build. And there are a number of key areas that we need to make sure we focus on. AI is really a cluster of technologies. So I think the vision here would be collaboration, not just on AI, but also a series of other technologies too, so that we're able to quickly bring those things from the idea to product to then field it within the U.S. government, whether for the military or again across the government, because there's deep need, not just on the military, but with civilian agencies as well. That's it for this week's podcast. I want to thank Kevin and Raina for their time. I encourage everyone to read the National Security Commission on AI report, which can be found at www.nscai.gov. Regardless of how you feel about military uses of AI, it's critical that people involved in the field understand what the government is doing. The singularity may not be near. But AI is about to change your world, so pay attention.